So I'm Louie McCurley with the uh, Rope-Based Business Collective that is a joint project between PMI and Brandon Beavers. And um, we're happy to be here today to talk about more rope-based business topics. So uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody to uh, please mute while you're not speaking. Uh, if you have any questions at all, feel free to type them into the chat box and um, we will talk for a little while. Uh, we're going to let our speakers talk for a little while and then we'll have a time of open question and answer for anybody that wants to Q&A and then this information will be posted later. I'd like to introduce Brandon Beavers. Uh, Brandon was the impetus behind this project. He was the motivator to uh, help the, the concept get started. And uh, so Brandon, I will let you introduce yourself and our speaker. Thank you. Um, yeah, I got started in Sprat back in, I think, 2016. Um, worked with a guy of Chattanooga just doing some building maintenance before I went and got my Sprat level one and just started taking off from there. But uh, a couple months ago, I just wanted to get in touch with people who knew more. I wanted to learn how to start a business, learn more about rope access. And I was like, hey, Louie, you want a mentor or a mentor me or have a student? And she's like, yeah. So she had this great idea for this video meeting every few weeks. And yeah, it's just a good platform to share and learn and get together with, together with other people from the community. But today we have Trask Bradbury. Um, from what I hear, he's started and built a couple rope access companies. And that is just the person that I should probably be hearing from. So we'll let you give yourself a quick little introduction and then we'll do a screen share and let you do your presentation. Thanks for that, Brandon. And Louie, thank you for putting this on. Um, so my name is Trask Bradbury and um, I've been in the rope access industry for a uh, little over 15 years. Um, but when it comes to officially being a Sprat certified technician, I started that in 2010. Um, so I come from a climbing background and that sort of segued into uh, helping a friend out do a project that he got where he was painting um, a really elaborate woodwork surrounding a church, uh, three-story church window. Um, I didn't know what Sprat was. I didn't have a certification, but I knew how to hang off of a rope from my climbing world. And uh, that's where I first learned about uh, rope access, as, as Louis McCurley likes to say, the bus to get to work. And once I did that, then I met a couple other folks and went to VRS PMI and got certification and slowly started to creep out into all of the other industries. So that is how I started in the rope access world. Awesome. Well, I know you have a little bit prepared for us for some photos. So if you don't mind doing your screen share and then kind of walk us through what you got. For sure. Um, so I'm going to screen share here and apologize for the non-official PowerPoint, but this is the project in which I spoke on where I got my first taste of what rope access work was. Now, here I am uh, clearly sitting on a skateboard deck and clearly not wearing a helmet. and one of the other key indicators is I'm hanging off of a Grigri, which is a Petzl product for climbing specific. When I say climbing, I mean recreational. Um, but like I said, having come from a climbing background, um, I certainly knew how to be safe and I certainly knew how to um, perform tasks at height, but it was before Sprat that um, this is kind of how I operated. Um, I do have a backup device on, um, I did know enough about that, and you can see that it's clearly not connected to the right D-ring. Um, but I've, over the years, I've learned a lot of things, and there's a big pie graph, and if you look at the giant pie graph, um, I would say 90% of that pie graph is encompassed by what you know that you don't know. So 
Um, after that, there's a section of what you don't know that you don't know. Uh, the rest, and I would say probably 20% of that pie is the things you know and the things you don't know. Um, but this is before what I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and we were safe, um, but hindsight 2020, I would certainly say that it's possible that, um, you know, something could have been encountered where we would have been stuffed. Um, and then this picture is shortly after in downtown Denver um, on a building called the DNF Tower, uh, the, the Lonnie's Clock Tower. And you can see that I have a backup device on and you can see that I'm using some edge protection, but it's not even in both ropes, it's just in the main rope. Um, but again, the backup device is not connected to the proper D-ring. Um, I'm wearing a full body harness and this time I chose to wear a helmet. However, these are sort of the growth aspects of rope access and to be honest, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with doing things incorrectly as long as you're working in a team and doing it incorrectly, that's not gonna cause any um, injury or uh, loss of life. However, this is one of those stages in life where I'm learning, uh, we're all learning, and we learn together, and every day, even today, in 2021, I'm learning, okay? Um, but you can clearly see that this is another one of those examples where um, I'm growing and I'm evolving, and I'm working in different fields. Um, and then as I began to evolve, I started reaching out and working with social media, which at the time was pretty new. And I started linking up with some engineering firms and uh, through just associations. Um, and then they were saying to, the, to me, hey, can you come help supervise this job site so that we can do our inspection? Um, and so this is a bridge in Cincinnati, um, the Charles Roebling Bridge, wherein I was just overseeing and supervising uh, some engineers that worked for a big uh, engineering firm at, for their inspections of this bridge. Um, and again, in my young days before I um, had officially started my first company, this is me uh, on a wind turbine site doing some internal tube work where we're going to be replacing the bus bars uh, brackets that held together um, these giant uh, cables that provided the transmission lines from the top of the nacelle down to the uh, grid. Um, I'm a level two at this point and I'm still learning about rope access and I'm working with a couple of Europeans on this job and they taught me new skill sets. Um, but it, it's around this time as a rope technician that I started to learn about clients and contracts. And I started to see, okay, well, we're working on 50 turbines on this one site and we we're there for many months. And so you know, I started to get a taste for what was possible out there as far as what I could provide as long as I learned. Um, so I, mean, I wasn't ready to fly the coop here, so to speak, but I was learning and absorbing very, very fast and quickly. Um, and that's where Gemini Rope Access was born. Um, I'm a Gemini uh, via the astrological sign, but I'm also a twin, an identical twin. And so that's where the name Gemini came from. Um, rope Access Solutions just seemed uh, normal to me. It just seemed like a right thing to say after the word Gemini. And it was my best friend from high school that came up with this, um, the mirrored logo of the repellers, the, the abseilers, if you're from the UK. Um, that's where the logo came from. My friend designed it. Um, so I went with it and um, it, it was catchy. You know, Gemini seems to kind of spark a little bit. Um, so, you know, when I was not at work and I was not working, I was thinking about how to create a company. and. I had to start from somewhere, so I started with the name, and then my, what it was I did. A picture of um, the arch on the Pat Tillman 
bridge that is just downstream of the Hoover Dam and getting ready to ascend up to the, uh, to the highway. And um, my client on this project was an engineering firm that had the contract to inspect the bridge. And my job was to rig the bridge and rig it in that they could do their job successfully. Um, it, just go ha it just so happens that as a rigger and a supervisor, every once in a while you get a chance to uh, have some fun like I did here. Uh, and this was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, one thing I learned on this was this is a different industry from wind. This is Department of Transportation. And I started to learn a lot about who is in charge of bridges, who is in charge of transportation, who is in charge of safety. Um, and I started to learn about the different facets of contracts, employers, clients, and all of that. Um, this was a very, very uh, poignant, pivotal point for me uh, in that I learned a lot about bridges and dams and all of the infrastructure of North America as well as everywhere else in the world, but particularly here in North America. Um, uh, here is, I, I've already by this time been sort of versed in the wind industry, um, but this was the first time that I actually had my own client, which was the uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which only became uh, a, a client of mine through a, um, my contacts with Louie and VRS and PMI, wherein at one point years before this, I was just photographing um, the local fire department doing their training on a MET tower here at NREL. And through that, uh, job, I met a couple of safety supervisors that work at NREL, which is a Department of Defense, or Energy, sorry, Department of Energy uh, government um, outfit. And it was then that as I cultivated Gemini, that I was able to um, become something in their mind there, oh, hey, maybe Gemini and Trask Bradbury can help us with this project. And on this project, this uh, particular turbine is um, they wanted to do a high visualization flow test. And so we're installing all these little pieces of yarn on this particular grid. And it seems like a really easy task just to go up there and tape yarn onto a blade, but there were very, very specific measurements. So we quickly learned how to take map measurements on a blade and put these yarns here. And then they run the, the machine and a high visualization camera shows what the um, tufts, they call them tufts, are doing throughout the re revolutions of the turbine. And it gives them an idea of the friction over the blade uh, and it changes blade shape. So with this test, engineers can then adjust their blade designs. So this was fascinating to me, this project. Um, and then our next picture, um, again, this is a, another client who I, um, through a friend, became um, aware of. This is an engineering firm that asked us to come and help uh, do NDT work. So we were reading the thickness of the steel at a lime processing plant. And um, this was my first time in a lime processing plant, but not my first time in uh, an industrial environment. So I know some of the uh, applications of PPE and what you need to do here. But again, I learned a lot on what the material we were working around did to our PPE, like the ropes. What kind of ropes did we need to use? Lime is caustic when it gets wet. So, okay, um, we're wearing one-piece suits. Uh, we're wearing respirators and helmets. But when you start to sweat, because you're moving around a lot, if there's any dry powder of lime that gets on you, you start to sting. And so I learned a lot on this project, one about how to protect your body from the environment, but two as well, um, what non-destructive testing was. This particular job was my first dance with what NDT meant, non-destructive testing. And so um, there's many forms of it. This one in particular, we were doing UTT, which is ultrasonic thickness testing. Um, so again, I'm learning a lot. Um, every day is a learning day. And um, starting to build that portfolio and starting to diversify, which Brandon, I think, is the key to a successful rope company, is diversification. 
Um, I think we can all agree that in 2021, if you're not diversified and then something like COVID comes and shuts you down and you're stuck in the wind, um, we at Masterpoint, which we'll get to, uh, we're so diversified that if one tree fails, we've got many other trees to pick fruit from. Um, and this next picture is one of those trees. This is where just through my climbing background and through my um, other times in, in the mountains, um, I created relationships and now I'm doing rigging. I'm rigging for stunts. Um, so stunt rigging. Uh, this guy here named Andy, he's, uh, they call him Sketchy Andy. Uh, he's, he's far from sketchy because he's very knowledgeable, but he wanted to be the first person to slackline between two hot air balloons. Um, there were a couple of guys out of France that tried it. They failed. And he did it. Um, but I went on this project just to oversee kind of like, you know, how to safely rig this. And it was very exciting. Um, but it's one part of the uh, industry. And then this is a classic picture of a couple of engineers, one of my clients in Denver, um, a small engineering firm, but um, we're in Seattle and we're doing a facade inspection on a building that looms over some busy streets. And there's it's facaded with a bunch of square marble tiles that were starting to uh, flake off. And clearly that's not good for any pedestrian down below. So this was my first project with BCME um, where we went down and um, I was their lead rigger, but every once in a while I was asked to go down and uh, help spray the building with more inspection. So I would inspect and then tell them what I found. I'm not an engineer. I don't have an engineering degree but I can certainly be told what to do and what to look for. And then I can document, take pictures, send video and give it to the professionals. Um, so you, you can see that they're not wearing helmets. And this is one thing that in our industry is uh, questionable, um, but it's my understanding that per OSHA, if there's no overhead hazard, then it's not mandatory to wear a helmet. Um, we as Sprat technicians, it doesn't matter what OSHA says, we wear helmets no matter what. It's very possible that someone up, up, up above could drop something, but um, these guys are kind of old school. I would say, wear a helmet. They would say, I don't want to wear a helmet trask. And I'm like, well, I can't force you to, but uh, it'd be nice if you did. So um, this is a picture of me when I'm not self-employed. So for years I had a client that was an engineering firm based out of Georgia. And they hired me to do all of their rigging and, and oversee their rope uh, work while they did a lot of NDT work in the pulp and paper industry. So we're in paper mills a lot and everything at a paper mill wants to kill you. Um, they were a client of mine for so long that they, uh, and at that time I was running Gemini by myself. Um, I'd be on the job sites with my employees and at night instead of going to bed i'd be running payroll or writing checks or basically doing everything all at once and after a, quite a few years of doing that the thought of a, a steady job a salary healthcare uh seemed pretty good so the company that i was uh that was a client of mine decided to say hey why don't you uh why don't you sell us your company and come to work for us and it was it was kind of like the perfect alignment of the stars i said yeah that sounds like a good idea so i did so i folded shop on gemini and went to work for this engineering firm and this was one of our projects which was fascinating it was awesome we were inspecting roller coaster rides uh we were replacing bolts tightening bolts um visually inspecting the welds and uh certainly no shortage of a view. So this was my first time going from self-employed, sole proprietor, to working for a company as a salary employee. And it was great. Um, I had a two-year contract. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of Gemini day. So we're backtracking, I apologize. But this is a picture where um, a very special uh, fiberglass company asked me to go and, um, and look at a piece of damage on a blade. And um, I'm not a fiberglass engineer or specialist, um, but I can certainly do what someone asked. So this was a blade inspection um, back in the Gemini days. 
another Gemini job, but this is um, this is a job where we were in, tasked by a contracting company to go install intermittent stabilization anchors. Uh, this is Denver. You can see the Denver Capitol in the background, but uh, it's required per OSHA that if you're going to have stage work done, the stages need to connect their cables every so many feet to intermittent stabilization anchors so that the sway factor is not as big. Um, so we drilled into the facade and installed these intermittent stabilization anchors and that was a very fun job. Um, projects like that are tricky in the sense that, you know, anybody could just go drill a hole and turn something. Um, but when it comes to doing it right so as to not get sued later, um, we need specifications, we need torque values, we need all kinds of different ways, methods of installation in which they tell us specifically how they want it installed. And we do exactly what they say as well as photo and, and video document. Um, so back at Gemini, this is where I start to get nervous as a company owner where I say, okay, well, before I say we're going to go on to this job, we want specifics from you and we want it in writing so that we can do exactly what you're saying and we can cover ourselves as far as um, liability is concerned. So these are some of the bigger things. I would say the biggest thing that I started to learn as a company owner was, hey, um, you know, we got to do exactly as the client asks. Otherwise, if something happens and if it happens, someone could get injured or killed, we need to uh, be covered. Um, so, so this goes back, this is a dam in Montana, and this goes back to now I'm working for an engineering firm as an employee. But again, I'm overseeing the rigging for some, um, you know, Army Corps of Engineer inspections on this big dam, which was phenomenal. But uh, it's more of the same stuff, but uh, I'm learning. I'm learning because now I'm kind of together with some bigger clients. Um, not only was I learning ab about new jobs and new rigging methods and, and new um, environments, but I'm learning by working for a big company. I'm learning a lot about profit and loss. I'm learning a lot about um, expenses i'm learning a lot about contracts how to run a contract how to make sure that we're maximizing our effort and minimizing our expenses so if there's one thing i can say i learned that was the most beneficial from working for another company it's how to, for a big company mind you um it's how to run an efficient job you know any not anybody but you know, a lot of rope technicians out there can tie the knots, hang the ropes, make sure everyone's safe. Um, but there's also a lot to a job site that is, um, so there's a lot of soft skills to running a company. Hard skills, I've always been told my whole life, and I agree with this, um, hard skills are easy. Anybody can learn a hard skill. Soft skills are not as easy. Uh, people are raised a certain way, they're used to a certain way, or, or they just think certain ways. So there's a lot of ways of dealing with clients, uh, dealing with job sites to make things efficient. Uh, you might be the leader of the safety, but it's the client that's in charge of the job and they do what they want to do. Um, and you kind of learn to push them a little bit or pull back a little bit and say, hey, let's take a break. So I learned a lot from this particular job. and by working for a large engineering firm. This is just another Gemini shot. Um, this was a job working for that firm wherein uh, we were at a uh, energy plant and you can see by the uh, technician, uh, one of my good friends, I still keep in touch with, we're doing non-destructive, we're doing UTT readings on the pipes. Um, but it was kind of outside the box and it was gonna take a lot longer so we decided to run some uh, tension lines. Uh, multiple lines across, tension them, and now the worker can work that whole span uh, simply by just walking it or scooting along and doing the work. So we saved a lot of time on this job uh, by thinking a little bit more outside the box in terms of rigging. Um, this was a really, this was probably one of the highlights of my career, um, but 
working for that engineering firm, we got a chance to work on the USS Missouri where we were doing more NDT work on the superstructure. Um, this is one of my old clients, an engineering firm where we were tasked to uh, measure and take deflection measurements of the space frame that was looming 16 stories over um, uh, an atrium in a couple of businesses in downtown Denver. And then who says you can't have fun on a job site? This is a couple of our employees where uh, it was Halloween and we were still on that one job. We were in installing intermittent stabilization anchors. Um, and so we dressed up like uh, superheroes. And then uh, I started getting into the um, offshore transportation industry where this is a cargo ship that, uh, that transports oil. Um, now this was fascinating because it was my first time uh, in the shipping industry, but typically you could see this, you can see my cursor guys. Yeah, so this is a frame and there's a lot of these in these cargo holds and they all need, every ship after a certain amount of years has to undergo a certain amount of surveys where they need uh, readings to see how much of the steel is degrading. Um, before this particular project, the way that they inspect these, by the way, it's about 70 feet down to get to the bottom of the cargo hold. Um, they would fill these up with water and paddle around in a raft and take the readings in a raft. And that is a lot of water and they pay for that water. So this is a cargo hold that's probably half the size of a football field, this particular ship. And you can see the frame is pretty deep. Um, so if you're floating in a raft and they have to fill the water up and you're in between frames, there's a very big hazard there where you could be trapped in a confined space. Um, that would be about $800,000 worth of water right there. And just to fill it with water, not to do the inspection. Uh, and so what we're doing is I, I came out here and I just looked around and I'm like, yeah, how do you get over there? Well, tension high lines, um, and it's about 80 feet across. Um, and so I came up with a very unique method in how to inspect all of the frames in these cargo ships. And since then we've been doing lots of ships because um, the client is very happy with saving a lot of, otherwise it's scaffold and that's even more money. Um, this is, uh, some, this is at a brewery. This is the uh, New Belgium Brewery in Asheville, North Carolina. All of the tanks were made by a company from Germany and when they were shipped over here, the lids were left off and there were a lot of imperfections that got into their tanks and that changes the flavor of their beer and nobody likes that. So we spent months on this project, um, polishing and doing non-destructive testing on the inside of these tanks. And it took a lot of ingenuity because some of these tanks were huge. And it was the first time where I had to figure out a way to get 30 feet out onto the sidewall of the inside of this tank from a manway that was in the center. So you can imagine if you hang a rope from the center of a tank and the walls are 30 feet away, how do you get to the wall? So we designed a monorail that could tip vertically, go in the tank and then change its pitch to horizontal. And then we would pin it up against the top of the tank and it swiveled 360 degrees. And then we took our main rope access lines and they went down from a tripod, across the monorail, and then down the sidewall. So now we had access 360 degrees to the sidewalls of the tank. Um, so that, you know, just another one of those jobs where you're forced to think outside the box. You stay inside the confines of safety, but you just, you're scratching your head, like, how do we do this? Well, that's the best time to, to, to be ingenuity. Um, this was an old uh, steam rail, the Rio in uh, Colorado in the back country. This was a fun job, but there's an instrumentation engineering firm that hired me to oversee the rigging for the bridge. They needed to install seismic uh, monitors on a lot of those trusses. Um, and I just stopped, and we all stopped to, to let the train go by for the tourists. But um, this was an exciting job, pretty outside the box, you know, nothing overhead. So we rigged off the train tracks on the opposite side, went over and installed 
a uh, very fun job. And here's another one of those rigging jobs where the diversification comes into play. This is when Fast and Furious Part 7 was filmed in Colorado. And through a climbing friend of mine, he called me and said, we need some people to over, you know, there, I have some friends who work in the entertainment industry and they need people to oversee some rigging for cameramen and stunts and stuff like that. So this was after one of the cars went off the cliff and it landed on its side, pinned up against this pine tree. So uh, that was fun. There's one of my friends and that's a cameraman that works for the company. So part of our job was to set up safety lines so that the cameramen could get into the equipment and then go down and work their cameras without fear of going off an edge or off a cliff. Uh, this is a good friend, Sean Kogan at Denver International Airport before the hotel was built, the expansion. Um, our task was to go up underneath the canopy of the, the big dome tents and establish some um, temporary anchors so that the welders could get equipment up there and weld permanent anchors up there. So that was pretty exciting. This is installing a banner for Pepsi at the Met Stadium during that Super Bowl that was at the Met Stadium back in, I think, 2000 and I can't remember the year. And this is some wind work at NREL. This is in the New Jersey at a shipping yard. I learned a lot here. Um, one, that you should pay attention anytime you're on one of those trafficy roads down there. They, those guys run around like crazy. Uh, this was in Miami where we had to uh, rappel down from a 500 story condo and around all aspects, elevations of the building, on all of the balconies are these um, plates that were precasted into the concrete and they were precasted incorrectly. So we had to get in there and we had to drill holes through this half inch thick galvanized steel and bolt on um, plates that had the correct holes for the window washers to clip their window washing stages to. So this was about three months of work and it was very, very difficult. And over the three months, this, uh, this monorail that you see right here that our friend Aaron is hanging off of, this was a brainchild of Aaron that you see in the picture of how we could access those plates easier. Um, in the first month, I was drilling holes into the underbelly of these cre uh, concrete slabs and plugging in removable bolts and then just aid climbing in. And then... Finally, we just designed this, uh, this access rail where you could just install it and then swing in and do the work. Um, this is some facade inspection in LA with uh, Mark Sucubo Engineering. And uh, not only do we get hired to do the rigging, but every once in a while we get hired to expedite the inspection. Um, this is a job so this is after uh, my time at Gemini and then after my uh, time at the engineering firm, I've now met up with my old um, buddy and now current business partner, Eric, and we got a job replacing this pane of glass over a busy street here in Denver. Um, and it was broken. I, we don't know how it was broken, but there were still a bunch of shards of glass in here. So I took my old black diamond portal edge from my climbing days and I cut out the hammock and then took the fly from the portal ledge and inverted it and so now we have a debris catch. So anything we remove, if we risk the chance of dropping it, it goes into this debris catch. And here's us doing some confined space certifications so we could all be uh, certified for confined, confined space work and rescue. Uh, this is Vortex Generation Installation in New Mexico. Uh, here we're doing a custom job where we were asked to uh, bolt on these 400 pound plates on the inside of a turbine that were attached to a big C collar on the external side. Um, this is some more of that atrium work. 
and now we're getting into some dam work and now we're starting to work with some um, geophysicists and geologists. Um, this is a dam in Colorado and uh, we're working with a geophysicist to evaluate the abutments on either side of the dam uh, as to decide how big they're going to expand on the dam. They want to uh, make this dam bigger. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically the the beginning to end of where I am now from a business owner to working for a firm back to business owner. And that's good information. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to enjoy re-watching this video and doing more questions. Um, I can already tell that we'll probably have to have you back again uh, later down that the road to answer more questions. What's that? Uh, but I, I can already tell that we'll probably have to have you on again later on down the road to answer yes, any more I, questions. I hope that wasn't too long. I wasn't sure how long of a slideshow uh, you had. You're good. Um, I do have just some random questions, though. Um, I like how you talked about diversification in the industry. That way, you know, like COVID hits, uh, wind was shut down for a while there. Uh, not completely, but definitely worked a lot less than normal but some of these jobs how do you market to these people how do you get the contracts because um, I'm looking at in the next year or so trying to start my own rope access business and I wasn't thinking about diversity I was thinking about building maintenance and stuff in the Chattanooga to Nashville and Atlanta area and you know within a couple hours of here but the diversity thing sounds great so yeah, I'm just curious of how do you get into that? How do you start marketing to these people and getting these contracts? Um, well, I guess the first thing that I would say to your question is there's no way to speed things up in life. Uh, there's, there, it took a lot of time as a uh, rope technician. I reached out to all the forums. I read all the job listings. And if I heard of a job in an industry that I hadn't been in, I applied. I didn't apply. I, I guess I just said, hey, I can, I can, I'm available. I'm a sprat level this. Um, I'd like to do that project. Um, but it took a lot of time to build the skills. And then once the skills were there, it was all about marketing. Um, it's all, and fortunately, social media was basically starting out, I would say, when I started growing my diverse portfolio. And so LinkedIn was there. It isn't what it is now. It, I'm sorry, it wasn't what it is now, but it was there. Um, Facebook was there. Instagram, I don't think was there at the time, not even Twitter. But what it was, was it was documenting what I did, taking that knowledge and marketing it. And um, I just mentioned this today to a friend of mine, but I had a lot of work come to me. Um, once I had the diversification and had the skills and I started up Gemini, a lot of people basically came to me because they had heard of myself and Gemini. I wouldn't say me, but I would say Gemini. You know, they're like, oh, we saw you on LinkedIn or we saw some really cool video on uh, Facebook. And marketing was the key, I would say that. Um, now, you have to follow up marketing with skills. So when I got a job, I did everything I could to make sure that that job went smoothly and that everybody was happy. And then now you're gaining a portfolio. Now you're gaining people that say, oh yeah, I hired Gemini to do this and they were great. Um, and then word of mouth started to travel. So that's what really I think was the catalyst for me was marketing and hard work and making sure that the product that was delivered was what they wanted and more. Did you ever reach out to a specific company or a specific job and like, I would love to do that. Um, Cause that's kind of what I'm thinking about doing here in Chattanooga is I've got all these things that I would like to go do. Do you just try and find out who's in charge of 
say fear who's in charge of maintenance and I did them a letter or an email or no I I'm not a big I'm, I'm 44 years old soon to be 45 I'm a meet and greet and a handshake guy so I never emailed and I never phoned I went physically to the locations and I said hey who's your um, building maintenance superintendent or who's the lead buildings engineer um, I did a lot of cold calling and I did a lot of knocking on doors and one of the best phrases that I've heard is spray and pray. So, you know, you can imagine that if you go after a lot and you only get a little, that's better than going after a little and getting none. So, you know, it is, it is um, a benefit to go out and knock on doors, introduce yourself, a handshake and eye contact go a lot way, a long way. So, not all of the work that I had came to me just because of word of mouth. Um, I did have to go out and bang on some doors and make those relationships. And it's just like everything in life. You, you can't just knock on a door and expect to have a contract the next day. Um, it might take a year. It might take two years. But if you plant the seed it, and water it, it will grow. So you have to go out there and you have to be fine with not getting a contract that day or that year. As long as you're making those relationships and keeping in touch and being authentic rather than fake, good things will happen. And when you say keeping in contact, do you go back every now and then and just say hi or give a call? Well, it depends on how far out of your uh, region they are, but it might just be an email or a phone call or a text um, after the initial meet and greet. But yeah, it's um, to this day, I'm still texting, emailing, and phone calling clients from 10 years ago that I know no longer work for. And I'm just saying, hi, what are you doing? Because um, they're friends. That's awesome. Um, something else that is kind of big to tackle, but maybe we just touch on it is insurance. Um, how'd you go about <laughs> describing what you do to an insurance company and getting the right coverage? I love this question because I still, to this day, I think last week I had a, fr um, a friend call me and say, I, my insurance just dropped me. Who's your agent? Um, back in the Gemini days, I was living in Colorado Springs and there was a local commercial building uh, insurance company. And I went in there and I said, this is what I do. I want insurance. And they had no idea what I did. And so I was classified as a mobile crane unit. I am not a crane and I am not mobile. I am a person, but I was, I was paying a pretty penny, um, but I was able to, through um, my safety record and through um, documents and photos, I was able to tell this agent or this broker, because they were a broker, um, not an agent. You know, there's the underwriter and there's the agent. The underwriter is the real, the real deal. Your agent can be great, um, but they might not get you the best policy. It's all about the underwriter. And so I was able to paint the picture to my agent and they said, okay, I see what you're doing. Um, and they went out and found an underwriter and they said, Trask, we were able to get you this policy uh, for $1 million general liability. Um, and at the time I was like, I really need a policy. I don't care if it's a little too expensive. It's what I need to get contracts. It's one thing to work on a smaller scale and get a job where they're not even going to ask you for a policy. It's another thing to get a contract for Siemens Energy. And they're going to say, well, um, we require this, 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 and this. And now you're going to your agent, you're saying, hey, see this email from Siemens? They want this. And your agent's like, well, let me go to the underwriter. And now your underwriter's saying, this is what it's going to cost. So it, it's difficult if you don't have deep pockets to just throw down for a policy for, an annu for a year that's going to cover your basis, um, but it's necessary. It's necessary, even if it means going out and getting um, help from family or friends or, or venture capitalists, you're gonna need to find the money to get a policy that's worth its weight in gold. Awesome. Lou, if you don't mind taking over for, for just a second, I'm gonna go adjust the blinds and not get so blinded here. I was going to jump in and ask a quick question. Uh, since you're on insurance and 
I like how you talked about getting contracts and mitigating your own risk for you and your family. And it's what I see a lot of people not doing in our rope act. You know, we, there's two sides of that business, right? <laughs> um, the rope access and that. And so when you talked about mitigating, like having the client give you your specs so that you can adhere to it, you were mitigating your liability, your, you to be sued and stuff like that. Um, can you elaborate any on that of, have you had a situation that went bad that you learned from or kind of guide a little bit um, about mitigating your personal, your family and yourself in those liabilities? Very good question. And the only thing I can say is I'm very blessed and fortunate not to have had an incident that made me aware of how much I need to mitigate. It's all come from stories from other colleagues and friends that have said, oh, this went sideways and we lost in this, this, and this. And I mean, ultimately what it comes down to is I don't care how much, if a company wins or loses, someone getting hurt or someone losing their ability to work moving forward or God forbid dying, that's it. Like that's all I need to hear to be scared enough in order to go out and get the proper insurance. Um, if you don't have the work volume and you're paying a lot of money for a policy, then that's extremely tough. Um, you need the work to make sure that there's income coming in to pay your policy. I'm not gonna lie, there's times where my company um, presently uh, gets slow and we have overhead and we have to pay employees and then we just re, um, did our policy for 2021 and they require uh, down payment and then you know the premiums and all that so it gets tough um, to make sure that all of that lines up but it's even tougher to live with yourself if there's an injury so our first priority is to make sure that our insurance policy is in place and then our guys get paid and then we go out and do work um, I don't know if that answered your question but I have been fortunate I mean in Gemini and then when I was working for the engineering firm, and then right now, presently with Masterpoint, we have had zero incidences, not even a hangnail. Um, and that's strictly because every job I go to, I'm even more paranoid. So every day is a day to be more and more paranoid because it's a question of when, not if. And it, it, it does help you slow down. Uh, it helps you slow down and realize that, hey, it could be, this, it could be today. So today, let's all be even more careful. Trask, you mentioned at one point um, when you were with Gemini, you mentioned that, you know, you'd be staying up nights paying your employees at the end of a hard work day. And you mentioned your employees again just a moment ago. Do you hire your employees as employees or are they subcontractors? Good question, Louie, and thank you for that because it was one thing I thought of from your last session with Mike. Um, we do not hire subcontractors. One, because 99.9% .9 of the time, they do not have insurance. Um, most of our clients, if not all, require that any sub meets or exceeds our insurances. So everyone we employ is an employee. We pay their workers comp and um, that's how we operate. So everyone is underneath our policy. So they are hired from the get-go as temps then or? Part-time employees. Uh, we okay. send them a new hire packet and we send them, um, we ask for avoided checks so that they can give us their banking information so that we can pay them through our payroll processes. Um, but everyone we hire is an employee for the time that they're working. And when you're not working for a period of time, do you lay them off or how do you work that? We do not lay them off. We keep them in the payroll system and they just go do what they're doing. Um, we've had a couple of employees that were part-time that because of COVID couldn't get any work and they filed for unemployment through us or used us as one of many employers where they filed their unemployment. So how does your insurance work with them when they are working for someone else? They are treated as... Um, a non-entity, if I if I could say, they they just they don't they're just a a, a space. They what what are you? Um, I'm I'm sorry. What are you asking? Are are they hourly with you or salaried with you? Oh, hourly. Okay. Yeah, okay. we have no salaried people. 
everyone is hourly. Um, there's only three of us that are owners and we're all salary. Uh, the rest are hourly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, another question I had is how, you know, you, you did Gemini first and then now you're doing the master point thing, but then you had that experience in between. How did, maybe it didn't, but in what ways would you say that working for a larger company most impacted your operation of master point as compared with your operation of Gemini? Oh, uh, wow. Um, in many ways. Uh, many ways. I learned a lot about um, some of the legal aspects of insurance, workers' comp. Um, uh, I also learned that there's a lot to do with um, how you treat your employees. Um, at the same time, I learned that there also is a way that you need to separate yourself um, as far as, you know, it. it it's, it's kind of case by case. I'm a very personable person. So no matter who I'm with, I'm going to be, I'm just going to naturally become very, very close with that person. Um, but you need to maintain a separation wherein, you know, they understand that, you know, they have a job. I have a job. I can't be with them all the time. Um, it was a very educational process. It was good. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other major points where um, I learned a lot from the employer. Um, ultimately, I learned a lot about what we need to provide as a company to the employee, um, what we are responsible for, what we're not responsible for. Nice. Got a question. Um, you spoke earlier about how to keep expenses low and efficiency high. What are some of the tips that you have to do that, to make sure that a job runs efficiently and effectively while keeping expenses as low as possible? Um, that's another one of those things where experience comes into play. Um, you're not always going to get the right formula. Some jobs might not be as profitable as others, but maybe it's a new job and you've never done that. Um, and so you're going out there and you're, picking tools. And when I say tools, it could be everything from the rope tools or the hardware of the tools of the actual job. Um, but over time and experience, you start to learn that, hey, you know, maybe we can save here by doing our due diligence of picking the right tool the first time versus the fourth time. You've gone out and gotten three other tools to make the job easier. So it takes time to learn how to make a job profitable. Uh, but once you start doing one particular industry, let's say it's commercial building work and your, uh, let's say your window washing, um, it's going to take a little bit of time to, to narrow in all of the specific tools wherein you can mobilize to that job and get it done in the least amount of time, uh, with the least amount of gear. Uh, but sometimes it takes a little bit of money to make the team and the project go smoother. So there's a little bit of salt and pepper involved there. Um, but I think it takes time to make a job uh, in a specific industry the, the most streamlined possible. Did you start with just buying a little bit here, a little bit there, or did you start off with a business loan? Um, yeah, how, how did you get started when you started each company and get it taken off? Um, I started with the bare minimum. I had a significant amount of rope and then I had the personal PPE and then some rigging equipment. And it was enough to get work as a job supervisor, a site supervisor for some engineers that needed to do facade inspections off the side of a building or a wind turbine. And then as I started getting contracts and saving money and um, getting more contracts, if a job came up where it required this particular kind of gear, then I would go out and have to buy that gear, um, whatever it took to make that job go um, as smoothly as possible. I also had the benefit of creating relationships uh, like PMI and like ClimbTech and like uh, Harkin, wherein I was provided the equipment for marketing. Um, you know, I would exchange marketing and um, basically marketing 
in order to get equipment at a lesser cost. Yeah, that's great. Um, something that is kind of vague, but something I always like to touch on is pricing of jobs. I know with, it's so diverse that we can't really dive into it that well, but what's some of the things to consider when you do price a job to make sure that you're not just going out there for pennies? That is a very good question, and I'm sure that there's pretty much anyone that's going to see this is going to be like, whoa, pricing, that's, that's difficult because, one, you don't want to give away trade secrets. Um, and it's not that it's secret. It's, it's, it's not a trade secret. It's just you don't want to give away your competitive edge. Um, but the one thing that I can say is, one, you need to do your research um, and see – and by doing your research, you're going to be just doing internet searches and um, word of mouth and talking to uh, colleagues and getting an idea of what um, a project's going to cost. I still lose jobs. We, as a company, still lose jobs because we, we just lost a job today to a client that basically gave it away for free. Uh, not a client, um, a, a, a competitor. They gave their work away for free because we thought we were um, pretty low. Um, we, we get jobs where we didn't think we'd ever get it because we thought we priced it too high. So again, that's one of those things where over time and experience, you start to dial it in and you're turning it and you're like, okay, this is that, this is that area where we're gonna be competitive. Um, I've heard in a lot of industries that if a company can, make a 20% profit margin, that's pretty ideal. Um, the job that we lost uh, to, to another vendor, um, they probably were making 1% profit margin. Some companies out there, just for the sake of getting clients and jobs, they'll pay for it. They'll do the job at cost just to get the exposure uh, and to get their name out. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, those typically those are really really big companies. You know they can afford to lose the profit in order to gain the client. Um, yeah, the way that I've learned how to price jobs, it took all of the years that I've been in this business in order to say, okay, I feel like we could offer this, and if we lose it, fine. But if we get it, um, we're going to give them the best product they've ever asked for um, and that's how you get repeat customers is by giving them the best that you can um, I know I didn't exactly answer your question because prices that's something that no one's ever going to share their prices with you period um, and if they do then good for them um, I, yeah. I think I have a, a question that might kind of play into that a little bit Trask um, do you price your jobs as though you're pricing a a rope access like an act like do you, do you price it based on the, what the access will cost you or do you price it based on the job that you're doing that's a good question louis um we base it off of a mixture of the access and then the actual work you know the classic like you said you know rope access is just the bus um one of the jobs that we recently lost was to a non-destructive testing company where they needed rope access, but the, the work was NDT work, and it's a big company. So they essentially don't even factor in rope access. They basically factored in just the labor for the, for the, for the work. Um, it's, it's case by case, it's client by client. Some jobs you can charge an exorbitant amount of fees to because there is no alternative, and they have no choice. As rope access grows, so does competition and what i once was able to charge an arm and a leg for i'm now not able to charge an arm and a leg for the volume and the, the fishing pond is getting bigger if it's any consolation it's the same in rope yeah yeah and so there's also multiple ways to um charge a client there's time and materials and then there's lump sum so you know, you might be able to get away with a big lump sum uh, proposal and then um, the client likes it because you're gonna get out of there in half the time. Um, and it's good for you. 
or there's time and materials where you might be there for a long time and it's going to take quite a while to figure something out. So there it's, it's an equation that nobody has the, the exact answer to, but over time you learn to uh, dial it in a little bit. I can think of one example where, you know, Louie, when you wanted to move the tower from the old facility to the new facility, um, I bid that project and we didn't get it because you could do it in a cheaper way through another means. And, that's exactly what life is. It's like, hey, you know, you reach out, you ask all these things from different clients, and so earlier you spoke about staying up all night, or instead of sleeping, you're doing payroll, you're doing all this. Do you would you have done it differently? And if you did it again, would you get a QuickBooks or an accountant to do some of that work and spend a little bit extra money? Or were you yes, with the late yes I would. Yes, I would. Um, at the time, I didn't have the money to pay someone to do it. Um, QuickBooks was something that I wasn't familiar with, and it probably would have taken me the same amount of time to learn how to use QuickBooks, which now I know, but then I didn't. Um, but at the same time, it was a valuable lesson. It was, you know, sometimes you have to make a mistake in order to learn. Um, I know I'm, I have to learn by making mistakes. And fortunately, I've never learned by losing a finger or an arm or something. But yeah, um, I would have done it different. I would have probably reached out to more people. Um, and that's a good segue into what I learned from running my own company by myself to working for a big company to now where I am with Masterpoint. I was fortunate enough to um, link up with my friend and business partner, Eric. He was once at, at one time, someone I hired for a lot of wind work up in North Dakota when I was running Gemini. And I quickly realized that Eric was um, a leader and he definitely was good at what I was not good at. And I knew that then, um, you know, he would email me and say, hey, you know, your payroll was off. I did some Excel work and, you know, you owe us for this. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Eric. And so when I linked back up with Eric and he had started up MasterPoint um, on his own and he had literally just started it and I m met up with him and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm trying to start up a company. I'm like, let's do it together because you are strong at where I am weak. And that's what makes a good company is knowing where you're weak and finding a way to fix that weakness. And um, that's where I am now is with, with the right mix of what he's good at and what I'm good at. And together we can make a really good team. How does that work with working with someone else, uh, co-owners, finding expenses and splitting it and delegating responsibilities? Um, that, that's kind of curious to me. Um, just sharing ownership like that. How do you do that? How does it work for you? Well, uh, it was in the very beginning, it's just first finding someone that you think is compatible and together you say, let's do this. So you have an agreement together. Um, we didn't have anything in paper. We didn't have anything in writing. We just said, let's do this together. And um, it's one thing if something had already been up and running for 15 years and someone wants to come in, you know, clearly there's something there that has been built by one person. Uh, so this person's got to pay their dues, pay in or do something to gain some sort of ownership. Um, at this point in time, it was so new that we basically said, let's do this 50, 50. And that's a very easy way to do things 50, 50. Um, so we both put in, I want to say 1500 bucks, I think. Um, we, yeah, we both put in 1500 bucks and we said, here's how we're going to do it. I had had some clients that I brought with me from all of my previous years. He had had a couple of clients and we just started hitting it hard. Uh, again, marketing is key. Um, uh, I wasn't able to say, hey, you know, this is Gemini 2.0, um, but we were able to say, hey, you know, we didn't go anywhere, here we are, we provide this, this, and this, and we had the media, we had the documentation, we had the clients, and we had the uh, testimonies from our clients to say this is what we offer. So the work started coming. 
Um, so when the work starts coming and you build the bank portfolio from the company and we start acquiring gear, it's pretty simple um, to go in 50-50. That's great stuff, Trask. And, um, you know, it, it's it, one of the things that you said during the conversation was there's really no way to speed things up. You kind of poke the seed in the ground and, and you give it lots of water and sunshine and, and that's, it's just what you got to do. And yeah. uh, definitely words of wisdom for sure. For sure. We have just passed the one hour mark, so we need to draw it to a close. I wanted to see if there's any last questions or comments before we close off. If I've got any one last question, it's the same one at every meeting. Uh, just your last tips and tricks for doing what you do. What's the best piece of advice that you have? The only advice that I would give is to be true, be authentic, and give anyone the best that you can offer. That's it. I mean, just be your best and um, the rest will follow. Which is great because that kind of sums up Trask Bradbury right there. <laughs> We're all going to fall from time to time, but if you be your best, that's, that's right. right. That's you know? right. I'm not perfect. <laughs> well, I've made a new contact today, so that's something. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I like the new beard, buddy. It, I like it too because my 10 month old doesn't have near as much to grab onto. Oh, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> yeah, that is important. Thank you so much for hosting this, Louie and Brandon. I appreciate it. No worries. We'll get it posted. And like I said, I, we, did, we haven't posted the one from a couple weeks ago yet. So we'll get that posted as well. As soon as we do, we'll uh, let you know that it's up. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you just sharing with the industry. You know, what, what we do for the industry as a whole is, is good for everybody. It, it, everybody wins. So thank you so much for being willing to share yeah. a bit of yourself with us today. You bet. Every day is learning day. <laughs>